So Steve, what is the relationship between passion and getting results? Jesus, you went in quick, didn't you? Yeah. Um, I think passion actually evokes a certain kind of um, stupidity, ignorance to anything failing. When you're really passionate about something, a lot of logic goes by the wayside. Mm -hmm. And so you get to achieve more things. So I found very early on that if someone wasn't really passionate about something, then it was very hard to achieve. Mm -hmm. um, but as soon as passion came in, the rules were rewritten, yeah. and you could just achieve so much more. So passion is the fuel of which the amazing things get done. Yeah. So like, what would be an example of that? I had, uh, I'm trying to think of one that would be a good, good antidote for it. I had a client that wanted to have a meal in Italy, and he wanted to have the most amazing meal that, it, that could ever be had, and he didn't want it replicated by anyone else. He was very affluent. He was from uh, Northern uh, Europe. So he was quite a um, strong man of power, mm -hmm. shall we say, but he wanted to be able to use this as a boasting thing. Mm -hmm. And he wanted a very exclusive restaurant in Florence. Well, the bottom line of it is, is there's no such thing as an exclusive restaurant in mm. Florence. That kind of precociousness is reserved for London, New York, you know, Miami, LA. You don't get it in Florence. If you walk into a restaurant in Florence and you want a table of two, don't be surprised if you're stuck, stuck on a table of 10 mm -hmm. and you've just got a couple of seats at the end. Yeah. And by the end of it, you just ended up with 10 more people in your family. You know, it's that kind of thing. That's why people love Tuscan living. Mm. So we had to create something for him, but he had so much passion behind wanting to make sure there was some renaissance behind it and he wanted to do it to be cultured, that we actually managed to talk the Academia Museum that houses Michelangelo's David into closing down for us. And then once we got that, and this is where the stepping stones of passion go, we were able to convince Andrea Bocelli to come in and actually serenade the clients halfway through dinner, which we set up at the feet of Michelangelo's David. So. When you go to someone with something that's out of this world and crazy, then they're gonna be looking at you cynically. Yeah. If you go to them showing that something that's out of this world and crazy and exciting, then they wanna be involved in it. I believe that passion is the drug of choice for most people. You have someone crying, you have someone laughing, people are gonna to wanna to hang with the person laughing. So if you can get passionate and really engrossed in something that you want, then you can actually bring those people into your passion. If you get them as an advocate to your passion, job's done. So how, how do you communicate that then to other people? If you're excited about something, how, how do you get other people on board? That sadly is the, uh, the bigger question. Mm -hmm. And sadly that, that part of your question has got so little to do with passion. Mm -hmm. It's got everything to do with the communication of it. Okay. Um, now, and this is where I get on my soapbox, we're at a moment in time where communication is a dying skill set. And you see the top of heads of most people nowadays. You know, people go into a restaurant and they're down on their phone, you know? You get a bunch of kids at a restaurant and they're bloody texting each other what they want to eat rather than just asking each other. The one that really annoys me is when you're in a coffee shop and someone's asking for coffee while checking their, their emails yeah. No eye contact. And I know some people in the military that say that the youngsters that are coming in now, a lot of them have trouble with, with command presence, mm. um, which was a term that Sasha Larkin actually uh, told me about, and she's with the Las Vegas Police Force. Mm. And these people are coming in, they don't have that command presence because of the eye contact. Mm. Eye contact's going, how to actually communicate with people is dying, and they're relying on these social platforms yeah. to actually be sociable which calling it a social platform is, is like calling cancer a common cold. It couldn't be more dangerous. We are losing the ability to communicate. Mm -hmm. Once you know how to communicate, then you can actually listen to someone and go, well, okay, what's exciting you? And then they tell you what's exciting you and how can that happen? And will, if we do this, is that really gonna wake you up at two o'clock in the morning? Once you've got that out, once you've used your in an Indiana Jones or you're in a Sherlock to get out of that person what really excites them, then you can go, I got it. I know exactly where you're coming from. And then you can go to someone, and like I do, I will speak to someone and I'll say, look, I've got something that straight off the bat is gonna sound ridiculous, mm -hmm. but crazy people do crazy things. Shall we get crazy? Mm -hmm. And people suddenly start, all right, what's, what's coming? And then you go, I've got this story to tell you. Mm. 
it's this couple and they want to do something magical mm. in Florence. Can you imagine th this story for years, for decades? Because I'm sure as hell, if you let us do this, doubt if you're going to allow it to happen again. Mm -hmm. And if it is ever done again, there was only ever the first time that it was done once, mm -hmm. you know? So get them into that kind of mold, get them buying into your dream. Uh, but first of all, the point is to find out why it's passionate for that person and to be able to harness it, to be able to communicate it to someone else. So the key there is actually not the passion, but the communication of that passion. Yeah, it sounds like it's a lot about listening to how, how, like, how do you ask the right questions to get that passion out of people? We were all geniuses up until about the age of five and then we started becoming stupid. Yeah. Um, and we became stupid because we were told by our parents, me included, no, you don't call him that. Oh no, you don't say that. Mm. Like, let's be honest, I walk down the road or if we're in a pub, and I, I look at you and I say, I really don't like your haircut, okay? Straight away, you've reacted. Yeah. Within a split second, you've reacted. But if I text you that, mm. you know, then I don't know what your reaction is. I don't mm. know whether you're laughing, you're crying, you're angry. We're losing the ability to gauge reaction off of anybody. Mm. And that's the issue that we've got. So when we were younger and we would walk up to Johnny in the playground and say, Johnny, you're fat. He either laughs, cries, or punches you in the face. But you had a reaction, mm -hmm. and you learned from that reaction. Mm -hmm. Now we're in a situation where we're actually losing that. So what we've got to do, and one of the things that I do when I go along and I, I speak and I consult with people, is I get you back to being five. Mm. I get you back to being coarse and ugly and raw. Because if it's coarse, ugly, and raw, then we can polish it a little bit. Mm -hmm. But if I argue with you for half an hour, you're going to probably guess I've got a problem with you. Mm -hmm. But if I punch you in the head the first second I see you, you're going to come to the exact same assumption, but a lot faster. Mm -hmm. Okay? So I'm there to kind of like try and get people to reverse engineer everything they've learned about the wrong art of communication and get them back to a point where we sit down and go, I've got a problem. Can we see what can handle it? This is what I'm getting. Mm. And how many times when people talk, you go, hang on. No, you didn't hear me right. And you go, oh, I'm so sorry. I'll be, that's been, how many times does that happen? All the time. All the time. Yeah. But if you're leaving it to email and text. Especially over email and text. Oh. Yeah. Well, there, there was a, um, a scientist, a uh, guy a million times smarter than me, which is not really a long shot. In, uh, he did this summary that said that there were eight people that read your email. <laughs> and it was these different uh, states of your mind mm -hmm. through the day mm -hmm based on what was happening to you at that moment was to how you actually read that email. Mm -hmm. So you could turn around to someone and go, uh, Steve, beer tonight, 7 p.m. And if he's in a good mood, he's going to go, yeah, great, let's go out of it, yeah. And you're going to text back or email back and go, great, see you there. But if he's in a bad mood, he's going to look at that as demanding, mm. as though it's maybe like authoritative. Mm. Now you're trying to demand that he be there. Why? You know, no, I can't make it. I'll be there at 7.30. All of a sudden, that game starts to happen. And you get that email and go, why is he being a prick? Mm. You know? So all of these things are changing. And as I say, social is not social. Mm -hmm. So it really means that we've got to reverse engineer or de-learn mm -hmm. what we've been learning over the past years and get back to making phone calls. One of my little tips and tricks that I do is um, we have no email Tuesday. Okay, we literally, we call it no email Tuesday. You can have no email Wednesday, but we think no email Tuesday sounds better. Um, but the bottom line of it is for the first hour, we check all of our emails. And then for the rest of the day, we communicate with our clients by every other form other than email. And do you know the daft thing that happens, and my team really enjoy this now, mm. is I get an email and I look at the email and then I phone up and I go, Will, how are you doing? For a start, nine times out of 10, Will's surprised that he's getting a call from me. Mm -hmm. Because how many people actually use their smartphones to actually phone anyone right. now, okay? So I'm phoning up Will and I'm saying, Will, I got your email and yeah, you laid it out there, the kind of stuff that you're looking for, but I wanted to just chat with you to see if there's anything that we're missing. Mm. There's never been a call that I've made where it hasn't changed the dynamic or request of what the original email was. Mm. Because I've gone, well, that's fantastic. Yeah, you want to do this, and you want to do it in Miami, and you want to do it in July, but have you thought about the fact that it's hurricane season? Mm. You know? No, I haven't thought about that. You, you've just saved yourself backwards and forwards. Yeah. You know, and you've been able to just bring it, and say, well, look, that's great, but 
you know, have you thought about doing it near a home? Mm. We could therefore increase the experience because we've now lowered the travel budget. Mm. Wow, I never thought about yeah. that, you know? So it's just all these kind of elements. The dynamic change has changed every time we've done that mm -hmm. on those uh, no email choosings in the communications. Video text, audio text. Yeah. There's a million ways you can actually do it. Mm -hmm. Sending someone a letter. I love sending post. Mm -hmm. um, but any other way other than responding to that email. So we try to teach people, and I urge anybody listening and watching to just try to get back to being five, try to get back to the, the ugly raw and the impactful way mm -hmm. to communicate where you say something, the other person reacts, you can respond to that reaction, they can respond, that's communication. Mm. So you talk about being really raw, but at the same time, there's, there's a stuff around you, you were, you're called like the Wizard of Oz, and there's this <laughs> talk of magic and desire and passion, all these, all these very pretty things. How, how do you bridge that? How are you giving people something that is really desirable, kind of a fantasy? So I've never given anyone anything that they asked for. I've, already, I've always given them what they desired and needed. Yeah. And the, the trick, the hack, if you want to call it, mm -hmm. is to do this really stupid thing called listening. <laughs> and I said to you at the beginning about Indiana Jones, Sherlock Holmes, we're like psychiatrists. Mm. You know, someone, I'll give you another story if it doesn't bore yeah, you. Yeah, please. I had this uh, guy contact me and he was referred to me from Richard Branson. Wow. And he contacted me and he said, uh, hey, you're apparently the guy that I should speak to. I want to meet the rock band Journey. Mm. So I said to him, and it, this is all video, so I'm not going to mention his name, but there's, there's actually a, a whole live show on this thing. And I turned around and I said, sounds great. Send me 10 grand and we'll make it happen. And that was the end of the conversation. I emailed him my address and told him where to send the check. Mm. Okay? I had no idea if we could do it. I had no idea if I wanted to do it. But the first thing I wanted to do before I spun my wheels is to know how committed he was. Mm. Okay? He sent me a check. A couple of days later, I got the check. So then I phoned him up and I go, okay, I know you're real. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not going to do anything with this check because it's going to cost way more than that. Mm -hmm. But let's have a chat. Let's find out why, what you're trying to do. Let's, Let's get the reason why. So I said to him, you know, what do you want to do? He said, I want to meet Journey. Great, okay, why? Now, why seems to be an offensive word mm -hmm. to so many people. Mm -hmm. I have people contact me on Facebook and all these other platforms and they go, hey, we should talk. And I just, I just text them or email them back or however, and I just go, why? Mm -hmm. And quite simply, I want to know, why should we chat? Make it interesting. Why should we communicate? Why should I take time out of my day What's important here? Yeah. And then I get some people go back, good question. I run this, I do this, and I feel as though we could benefit each other. Great answer. Let's schedule a time. Okay? It's not offensive to ask why. So I asked the guy why, and then he's like, oh, uh, you yeah, know, I'd just like to meet them. When you're really getting down into someone's core, mm. they start getting defensive. Mm. If I ask you what your social security number is, what your religion is. You know, I can see it happening now. Yeah. When was the last time you had sex? You know, any of these, how much money's in your bank? Mm. Any of these questions are private and personal, but they're also a fact. Mm. This is your social security number. Your bank account's gonna go up and down. You know, your religion's X, and the last time you had sex was none of your business. <laughs> but they're all facts, okay? But if you start getting into these people, they start getting a bit squirmy. Yeah. If you ask them, what really excites you? Why do you want to do X? That's revealing your soul. Mm. And a lot of people don't like to do that. Yeah. Okay, so you, you say to people, why do you want to do it? The first answer of every single question, every time I ask that is like, wah, wah, wah. ignore it. Right. It's just, you're just getting over that hurdle. Whatever they say, I don't care, I'm not tuning into it, because they're making a statement for me to make, for me to assume that there's some kind of logical reason behind it. The, the answer they're giving me is, to, is an answer that makes it sound smart, mm -hmm. okay? Nine times out of 10, as I say, it's not. So I ignore it. I go, oh, why do you want to meet that? Oh, I've already gone to sleep. Right. Whatever they answer, I go, okay. Is that really gonna do it for you? Mm -hmm. I'm kind of, feeling there's something a little bit underneath this. Can we, can we delve into that? You know, what makes this so important? And tell me, if we do this, are you gonna wake up at two o'clock in the morning at any year in the future and go, I can't believe I did that. Because mm. I'm 
not kind of feeling as though you would. Mm. So what do we need to do to give you that 2 a.m. wake up call? And then they're like, well, I'd like to do. So this guy wanted to meet the rock band journey. So we went through the whys, and I always say, ask, ask why three times, mm -hmm. okay? And uh, we're chatting with him. He is a very successful CNBC commentator, a big money man. And um, there was a time in his life when he was at school and he was at college and stuff and university where he had no money, you know, like most people at college and university. And he used to sleep on his mate's couch and he was the lead singer of a cover band for Journey, mm. okay? And he went through the usual kind of turmoil of life and the losses and the loves and the pains and the growth, like we all do, it's called life. Mm -hmm. All the way through, Journey was there almost playing the soundtrack oh. to his movie. Now he's very successful. Yeah. Okay, now he's enjoying the twilight years. Now he's enjoying the, the benefit of that period. Mm -hmm. So he wanted to thank Journey for giving him the soundtrack to his life. Yeah. So I said, great. So you're telling me that if we actually walk up backstage after that hot and sweaty from doing a concert and you shake their hands, that's going to be the finale of your movie? <laughs> you know, they ain't going to remember you. They're going to be like, you know, yeah, how you doing? Yeah, good, uh, gone, mm -hmm. you know? We need to get a two o'clock wake-up call going here. Mm -hmm. So, I see, And that's where I get involved. Now I know the story. Now I know the growth. Now I know the passion. Now I know the reason. Mm -hmm. I've got the ingredients. Mm -hmm. So I was able to connect with Journey, mm -hmm. tell them about this story, yeah. and I wanted to see how we could do something about it. And we found out along the way that my client's uh, brother's son had autism. Mm. The drummer's son of Journey has autism. Mm. So why don't we do this for Autism Speaks? Why don't we satisfy this client's fantasy, conclude the chapter in his, in his movie, by also raising awareness for autism? I gave a win that was beyond financial gain yes. to the rock band. Mm -hmm. So we took it as far as we could and my client actually walked on stage in San Diego, live on stage during concert and sang four tunes with the rock band Journey and is now deemed as the shortest term lead singer of the rock band. So that's far cooler than just going backstage and shaking hands. That's the 2am wake up call. That's the stuff that forever is going to be boring people at cocktail stories. About. <laughs> yes, that's incredible. So these, these win-wins seem to be part of your secret sauce. How, how do you find them? What are you, what are you thinking? What's the process behind finding these win-wins? Oh, primitive. Um, I, from a very early age, mm -hmm. um, and you know, my background is I was a bricklayer in East London. Yeah. So, you know, I consider myself an educated man, but school had nothing to do with that. Mm -hmm. And I want to get into a certain crowd. I want to get into a certain event. For me to be able to do that, the easiest way for me to attract you is to bring value. Mm -hmm. So I believe that if I want to start a relationship, I've got to be the first person to bring something to the party. Yeah. So I will actually research and stalk. And of course, like our iPhones and our websites and our internet give us a brilliant ability to stalk people now um, and to educate themselves uh, on, on what they like and they dislike. So whenever I go to someone, I go, hey, I want to be able to do this, like the autism. So and this is my client. But hey, I was thinking before we get into what I want, I believe this can raise awareness for something that you need attention brought to. Yeah. So I'm now giving them a reason to continue with the conversation. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Like when I had Andrea Bocelli come in, uh, I actually contacted him and I said, look, you know, I'd like you to come in and actually sing mm -hmm. at a dinner party for six people. Mm -hmm. We're talking about one of the most iconic singers in the world and, a, and an Italian icon, yeah. uh, it's like asking Elvis to come and sing at your barbecue, you know, <laughs> with only six of your mates. Yeah. Um, but um, I had to make it a win for it. I said, however, I'm aware that you're heavily promoting the Cancer Foundation mm -hmm. that you're part of and you're supporting. Mm -hmm. I've got an idea how I can actually benefit that. So can I continue? I'm bringing value straight in and telling it what's in it for you. The bigger the celebrity, the bigger the profile and stature, even if it's only assumed by the person, mm -hmm. they may not be that big, but they may act big. Mm -hmm. You've got to pander up to it a little bit. Um, bring value in. 
-hmm. And whenever any of these people are talking to you, the first thing they're going to do when they look at you is go, what's he after? Mm. Now, I've been in some uh, lucky, lucky places with some very well-known and famous people. And I'll be talking to them and you'll see someone come over and you'll see the person look at them and you can see it in their head. They're going, okay, is this going to be someone wanting a selfie? Is this, do I know this person? Who is it? What are they after? How is this conversation? It's a horrible situation to be in. I would not want to be uh, as famous as that. Mm. You know, I see these people and it makes me cringe. Mm. And they've said, you know, they, they don't know where it's going to go. But if you can come over and go, hey, how are you? Um, I, I've got something I wanted to ask you. But you, before I get into that, I know you're releasing a book. I know you're part of a movie. I know you're trying to raise funds for this. I've got something that can help with that. Yeah. You know, should, can, is it all right to continue? Mm -hmm. I'm giving you something of value. Right. And that is the best way to kind of keep the door open. Mm -hmm. I also believe that um, relationships have a greater uh, return rate than anything you'll ever find on Bitcoin. Um, and so I'm a great person that tries to constantly mold and nurture mm -hmm. and turn relationships. I have this, this little thing that I go on about how many 300 year old oak trees do you have in your Rolodex? And I tell people that when you meet someone, that oak tree is a tiny little seed mm. and you're going to water it. You're going to nurture it. You're going to protect it. Mm. But for many, many years, anything can destroy that young tree, mm. anything bad weather, a rumor, uh, some malicious gossip, a competitor, it's very weak and fragile. But when it becomes a solid oak tree that's 100, 200, 300 years old, you can drive a bus into it and the bus is going to come off worse. Yeah. So the focus is when you get a relationship, mm -hmm. if you want that relationship to pay dividends mm. and to become a 300 year old oak tree, nurture that baby. Yeah. Wow. Steve, you, you mentioned that you grew up in a family of bricklayers mm -hmm. in London. And I wonder, how did you come from there to being CEO of a luxury concierge sort of company? How did you make that huge leap? I don't think I did. I think I just played in a different playing field. Um, for many years as I, was, as I was growing up, and very this, this makes me feel bad for saying, but I need to say it, I felt that I was incredibly poor. Mm. You know, we never, I never had a takeaway until I was 18 years old. Never had a takeaway. The idea of having food to delivered was something you saw in Hollywood movies. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, we got a new car once and it was 12 years old. Mm. Um, so the idea of having a new car was just, just beyond me. Um, I think I went on holiday twice. Mm. So I grew up and left home and tried to find a better way of life. Mm -hmm. Seriously thinking that I, I had a poor, hard childhood. Yeah. It wasn't until I grew up and was in my late 20s that I realized how wealthy I actually was and how fortunate I was. I knew what it was like to get up at four o'clock in the morning. I can get up at four o'clock in the morning now mm -hmm. because what I need to do, if I need to make a phone call and I need to speak to someone in Japan or the Middle East or something and it's two o'clock in the morning and we're talking about you know three quarters of a million dollars to get something doing, you can be <laughs> damn sure I'm on that phone call because I'll do what's necessary. And then I'll put the dogs out, I'll turn the lights off, and I'll get back into bed. Mm. Okay? We know what it's like to work. And entrepreneurs don't work until five o'clock, they work until when the job's done. Mm. And so I was raised on that. As I grew up, I realized the ethic and the strength that I was given because of that lifestyle served me well to achieve anything I wanted. Yes. Understanding that also you communicated with people, you communicate with people differently on the street than you do in an office. Mm. Okay, if you're on the street and, you know, I'm not trying to make out as I'm freaking Tupac or anything, but, <laughs> you know, if you're on a building site and you're, you're with someone, you know, some guys and stuff like that, and you tell a joke that offends you, the guy's going to tell, tell you, you know, tell you to go screw yourself. Mm -hmm. You know, you're going to know you stepped over the mark too far and you've got a lump in your head. Mm -hmm. You know, it's that it's that kind of not brutal, but very raw communication method yeah. that suddenly teaches you how. There are those that you can play with and push a little bit further, and there are those that you can't. Mm. And you treat these people a little bit different. One of the, if you want to learn about communication skills, yeah. real good communication skills, go to a bar mm -hmm. and go and watch the bartender. Mm. And go to somewhere that's not 
uh, you know, we're in Hollywood at the moment. So, you know, maybe go into like a, a Beverly Hills bar or, you know, go into like a Hollywood bar or something like that. And you'll see the bartender there and they will look across and there will be the crew in the jacket that have just come in from work. There'll be girls on the girls' night out. There'll be the guy that's traveling through. There'll be the local tourists that you know, just want to go in this cool bar. Within split seconds, that bartender will react to every single person. They'll go, hey, guys, how are you doing this evening? If you need anything, just let me know. Mm-hmm. And they'll be like, hey, girls, we're going crazy tonight. Should we start with shots? You will just see her and him react differently on the spur with each person. Mm-hmm. The communication of a good bartender is second to none. You can learn so much by watching that split reaction based on the body language, the response, the eye contact for the person you're going into. Wow. Yeah. That's a, that's a great lesson to take from a bartender. I was a, bar, I was a, a doorman. That's right. And uh, so, you know, I was on the door and you've got, you've got a bunch of guys walking to the door and um, you can't just stare at them mm-hmm. because then they're going to kind of like, you know, chest puff as they walk over to you. So you've kind of got to do all this kind of thing and just nonchalantly can I look as though you don't care while trying to clock as much of the body language as you can mm-hmm. to know whether or not you've got a problem walking towards you. And you've got to decide very quickly uh, based on how they approach you as to whether or not you say, sorry guys, it's actually busy in there at the moment. But uh, hey, if you come back in about another hour, or you know, there's a place down the road for you to be really cool. To you've got to know how to handle that real quick or you go the wrong way and you go, eh, no, you know, and all of a sudden it all kicks off. Yeah. You push someone into a corner, it doesn't matter how small they are, they're coming out with fists. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So how, how did your life as a bouncer then help you to, to build the, the network that you have now? Well, it was very easy because for a start, I made sure that I wasn't, I wasn't on the worst club in the area. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I was on an area that, you know, people wanted to make sure they could get in, they, they could spend money. Yeah. So... I had people wanting something from me. Mm-hmm. If I could help them by making sure they got the better table, or on certain nights even going, hey, it's a bit quiet in here tonight, so go down the road, go to a different one and come back here tomorrow. You know, if I could start giving them value by giving them advice and, get, and showing them where different events were, then I became a value add. I actually became an oracle of where the cool <laughs> events were within my area. Mm-hmm. And then before I knew it, I started throwing my own events and then started growing from there. So one minute I'm you know, letting you get into a Hong Kong nightclub, a nightclub, the next thing I'm doing is throwing uh, VIP parties at the Monaco Grand Prix. So it's the exact same thing, just on a bigger budget and scale and location. Just mm-hmm. same thing, different sandpit. Yeah. And how did, how did the bluefish thing come in there? <laughs> so in the 90s, where we didn't have this thing called internet, and we decided to make this leap from nightclubs and parties to start throwing our, other, uh, our own events, mm-hmm. um, we would invite people by faxing them where it would be. We, do you remember dial-up? <laughs> you know? I've heard of it. Yeah, you'd heard of it, yeah. So like after about 15 hours, all the faxes have gone through. Mm-hmm. And um, we would fax them where the location was. Mm-hmm. And we would send them a password. And the reason for the password was because we wanted to make it childish. Mm-hmm. Because the worst... The worst group of people in the world are middle management. I don't know, there's probably middle management out there moaning about it, but, but you are. You're the worst people. Um, because there's a chip on that shoulder. Mm. And so, you know, we would send out this, uh, these silly things, and it'd be like, name two of the Teletubbies. Um, finish this sentence. One fish, two fish, red fish. And the third one, we only had three. We didn't want to complicate it. The third one was name the lion out of the lion, the witch, and the wardrobe. Mm. Okay, so we would have people walking up to the door and they would lean in and they'd go, Tinky Winky Po. We'd be like, in you go, you know, have a good night. They were, they were confident enough mm-hmm. that they could have a giggle. Yeah. But the thing about arseholes is they don't get better with age. So if you can cut them off at the door, you don't suffer any problems later on. You, get, you allow those to get in there and they get a couple of whiskeys and beers under their yeah. belt, all of a sudden they're Bruce Lee and they think they can take the big guy on you got your problems. Mm-hmm. If you could cut it off at the door, you saved yourself the, the, uh, the dancing in there. Mm-hmm. So we would actually do this with people and we would give them all these different kind of passwords. Um, Aslan was the funniest one. Mm-hmm. You know, the Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe. You know, um, because we didn't have smartphones or things like that, 
if if any of the uh, the people turning up didn't have kids, then they were screwed. Mm -hmm. You know, they never had a clue what the bloody lion was called. So they would come up and they'd be like, oh, I don't know, you know, is it Roger? <laughs> We'd be like, bloody hell's a lion called Roger. I'm like, I don't know, well, in you go. And, and so it became this way of just breaking the ice. Mm -hmm. We would get people just walk up to the door and they'd be like, I'm here for the party. Mm. And we've got like a yacht going on in the background and it's bouncing and the music is going off and everyone's screaming. We'd be like, I don't think there's a party here, mate. You know? <laughs> we would just blank them and there'd be a lineup of people behind and we'd be like, Hey, John, is there a party? Here? No, I don't think so. I think he's got the wrong I think you need to go somewhere else, mate, because there's no mm. party here for you tonight. Mm. And then he'd go off all buggered off, and then the next guy would come in and go, Tinky Winky, and we're like, there you go. You know? <laughs> so it was just a way of that happening. Yeah. We didn't know what we were doing. There's a, there's a brilliant guy in New York called Ari Mizell, mm -hmm. and he came up with this little sentence um, or this little quote that made me realise this is what I'd been doing for my life. He says, get going and then get good. Mm. So... In the get going aspect, I was building a community. Mm -hmm. You know, I was building a Rolodex. I didn't know what it was going to do. Yeah. I just thought if I knew a bunch of rich people, I could get a rich job. Because guess what? Poor people, they can't afford nothing. So hang around with rich people. That was my entirety. I told you it was primitive. So I started throwing rich parties and it just grew from there. And I thought to myself, oh, any minute now, I'm going to just like ask one of them for a job. Mm -hmm. But before I knew it, I was traveling the world, throwing amazing events, working from everyone from Naris to Elton John to, to Richard Branson. Yeah. So it just kind of like <coughs> exploded. Mm -hmm. But it was all the same thing. And we launched, this, uh, we launched this company and we came up with this precocious name. And I forget what the bloody company was called because it lasted about two weeks because people would start calling us. And they'd be like, are you that bluefish company? <laughs> and we'd be like, no, we're not. We are, you know, blah, 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 blah some Greek god or something. Mm -hmm. And they'd be like, oh, I'm looking for bluefish. It's a, and we were like, well, we do the stuff. And we could. So it took about two weeks before we had to do a name change. Yeah. So the beautiful thing is I've noticed, if I tell you I'm brilliant, mm -hmm. it's marketing, branding, and self-promotion. Mm -hmm. If your best friend tells you I'm brilliant, mm -hmm. it's gospel. Mm -hmm. So when everyone started calling us bluefish, we had to be bluefish. Yeah. So we learned very early on that it's not what I do that's important, it's what you want me to do. Mm. So we became that person, whatever you wanted to do, wherever you wanted to go. You want to do some travel stuff? Yeah, we can organize that. You want to go down and see the Titanic? Yeah, we'll organize that. You want to hang out and get a guitar lesson from ZZ Top or a drum lesson from Guns N' Roses? Yeah, we'll handle all of that, you know? We just became this thing. And then in 2000, I think it was 2002, um, we were contacted by the New York Fashion Week. Okay. And they wanted us to become the official concierge. Actually, tell a lie. They wanted us to uh, help them with their VIPs. So I went, yeah, sure. Again, get going, then get good. You know, I'll work it out later, whatever that means. And they actually did a press release that we were the official concierge of the New York Fashion Week. It was eight years into Bluefish being in business, mm. and this was the first time anyone had ever called us a concierge. Wow. They didn't know what to call us before. Yeah. Concierge became a good enough box to stick us in. Mm -hmm. And since then, we became known as a concierge firm. Mm -hmm. But uh, up until then, you know, we were just bluefish. And I still think we're just bluefish. Yeah. It was, it was really clear in reading your book that the company's about people. It's about the people in the company. It's about the way that you treat the people you work with. That there is something more human to what you do than just uh, you know, a travel agency or something like that. There's, there's another layer to it. And one thing you talked about in having a password like Bluefish is kind of filtering out your relationships. So you've talked a lot about building relationships and filtering them out a little bit. Nowadays, how do you still know when not to work with someone? So I believe your stomach is far more intelligent than your head. Yeah. Um, and our eyes are tricked constantly. Mm -hmm. You see a guy in front of you, He's got a sharp suit. He's got a 50 grand Odomar on. You know, he's just got out of a R8 or a Bentley or something like that. So he must be successful. Mm -hmm. Your head's telling you this because he's got all the trinkets of success. Mm -hmm. But your stomach is kind of like giving you a few butterflies. Yeah. You know, is the, is the watch a fake? You know, did he rent the car? Is he just trying to impress me? Trust that. Because mm. every time I've trusted that, I got screwed. Mm. So now when I meet people... And again, I don't know if it's a street thing, um, but uh, it, it's that situation where 
you have all these reactions because we're animals. Mm -hmm. We are the slowest evolving technology <laughs> in the planet. And we're only getting slower based on the exponential growth of everything else, yeah. you know? And we've got a situation where we've got fight or flight mode mm -hmm. built into us. We walk past a hedge and it rustles, we're on that, okay? Our eyes aren't looking over and going, well, hang on, let me think about this. Mm. No, mm. we're on stance straight off the bat. You've got to learn and acknowledge the fact that we're still pack animals. Mm -hmm. We still need, uh, we still have the basic need and desire to mate and communicate and relate and group. Mm -hmm. And that actually goes even further into trusting when you see these people. Your reactions are actually very, very good. We've got a good mechanism built into us but our head's actually screwing with it. Mm. So whenever I meet someone, I let my brain fall asleep, which ain't too hard, and I trust my stomach here implicitly. Mm -hmm. And I ask myself a question. I ask myself this question with absolutely everyone I meet. Mm. Would I want to have a drink with you? That's it. It's a simple one, you know? Not have a meal, not go away for the weekend, you know, not, not get into a big major business with you. Would I want to sit at a bar and tell rude jokes and drink a whiskey with you. You call it the chug test, right? It's the chug test. You know, would I want to do that? Mm -hmm. And um, if I'm kind of like, oh, I don't think I would, there you go, yeah. job done. You're not in my life, you're not in my Rolodex. Or if you are, there's a little mark on there somewhere. Mm. But um, you're, not, you're not in my circle. Mm. It's, just, it's, it's very simple. And it's also not harsh. I've actually said to people, do you know, I know you're a cool cat, but there's something that's not gelling between us. Mm. So let's not waste each other's time here. You know, yeah. and I've said that to people. I had a guy actually was, flaunting, um, was flirting around at an event that I was at. And he was, he was like a little fly. Mm -hmm. And um, everything about him, his personality, his look, his style, whatever. Mm -hmm. There was something about him that was just kind of like not sitting well with me. There was no way in the world me and him were gonna become buddies. Mm -hmm. And so during another one of his little buzzes as I'm um, talking to a bunch of people, I went, hey, you know, come over here a second. So he came over and then we went over to the bar and I said, look, I know you intend to talk to me, but I want to make it clear to you that me and you are not going to become pals. Mm -hmm. Okay. I don't understand why, but my stomach's telling me that it's just not going to happen. Mm -hmm. You are wasting an immense amount of time by focusing on me when you could be focusing on all the other people yeah. in this room and it could be working for you. So I want to pay respect to my time, but I also want to respect you so that you don't go home at the end of the night losing out because you're wasting all your energy on a bad opportunity. I said, so leave me alone, go and focus on these people here, have good luck and get something done because you're spinning wheels here, man. Mm. And he was like, oh, okay. And he was kind of a bit kind of shaken up by that, that approach, but it needed to be a quick, swift band-aid, get this done so I can get back to a conversation without him being in that circle. Mm -hmm. And he went off. Do you know, he came up to me at the end of the night mm -hmm. and he just said, thank you so much. He said, I made some great connections. Now. But you know, the funny thing is, his persona had changed. Mm -hmm. Where he was buzzing and trying to get in, he was aggravating. Mm -hmm. Now that he had gone out and he actually had a few communications, he had had some confidence, he came up. He was a bigger guy. Yeah. Do you know, I've seen him at other events and we've actually had a whiskey. Yeah. So, you know, I won't mention his name, mm -hmm. but Mike. So. <laughs> That's cool. That's great how, how things can, can turn and how you, you, you make a great point that there's an opportunity cost in a, in a bad relationship, but to, to focus on the good ones. It's a cancer. Yeah. I'll give you one of the worst situations and I've had it before. Are you, are you in a relationship? Mm -hmm. Right, okay. So have you ever had a shitty phone call? Yeah. And then we do, we yeah. get them. And then someone you love or that's close to you comes into you after you've come off that phone call. What's the first thing that happens? You carry some of your shitty response over to them, don't you? Mm -hmm. Now, if they love you, nine times out of 10, they'll turn around to you and go, whoa, don't give me that. And then you can go, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to, I was on a bad phone call. What if that other person is a new relationship? Mm -hmm. That young oak tree we spoke about mm -hmm. that doesn't know you well enough yet to challenge you. Mm -hmm. And then they hang up and they go, what the bloody hell was wrong with Steve? Mm -hmm. I thought we were friends. Well, maybe I'm not. 
They don't, ch- they don't ask you the question. So you've taken that bad call and you've turned it into a spreading cancer and it's now just infected a new relationship. Yeah. And I know it's full well that if I have bad phone calls and you know when they're bad because you get off the phone call and you're tired, mm-hmm. is worn you out. Take something out of you. It absolutely does because you're trying to pivot, you're trying to adapt, you're trying to edit your, no, 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 what I, I, didn't, I didn't mean it to come across mm-hmm. that. You're constantly dancing on eggshells mm-hmm. and it wears you out and you can't make another call. You've then got to kind of get your flow state back up again. Mm-hmm. If you get rid of those out of your life, you stay in your flow state. If I challenge you this afternoon, okay, well, not this afternoon, because you wouldn't have time, but if I said to you tonight, mm-hmm. phone four of your best mates, mm. could you do that? You're smiling now. Yeah. I bet you you're lying. And should I tell you why you're lying? Okay. Because after your second call, mm-hmm. It's probably midnight. Mm. Because when you're on the phone with your mates, you're not doing this. It's just going. You're going to go, oh, crap, I've got to phone four people tonight. I've only phoned two, you know, because you're having fun. Right, the time flies by. There's no effort, is there? There's no stress. There's no friction. But if I said to you, phone four people that you dislike, that are in your circle, that you do business with, Mm. that you don't really gel with, You're also not going to phone all four because you're going to spend the next four hours giving me great excuses why you couldn't do it. (laughs) Those people should not be in your life. The thing is that you need a life that has no stress, no friction. And if people are causing you those friction, which let's be honest, most friction comes from bad people, Mm. get them out of your circle because then what happens is everyone you're calling, everyone you're talking to, you know, this meeting we had here, it got arranged because we had mutual friends. They contact me, I love hearing from them. Right. I didn't know you, right. but I know them. And I know they're cool cats, and I know they don't know many pricks. So <laughs> I, I took that as a good chance that this was going to be a good conversation. Glad you did. I'm glad I did as well. Yeah. Wow. So, Steve, another thing that you talk about is how you want to get better all the time. And, and you've said that in the book that you have a fear of the next month being the same as the last month, not getting better. How do, you, how do you keep that up? Well, it's very easy. We're driven by fear. If you walk into a room, any room, mm-hmm. and, you know, it could be a restaurant at lunchtime, yeah. okay, and you stand up on a table and you shout, everyone run outside, there's a million dollars. <laughs> how many people do you think are going to run outside? <laughs> Probably not many. Probably not many. You stand up on that same table and you shout out, fire. Mm. How many people are outside the room? Bingo. Mm. We're driven and impulsed by fear, Mm. that fight or flight. We run away from things far more than we run to things. Mm -hmm. So it's not a case of, oh, I'm not frightened of everything. It's redefining how the fear actually makes you move. Okay? I'm scared, terrified Mm. of being in the same position today as I am next month. Mm. Because that eventually will create stagnant. And anything stagnant becomes stale and dies. Personally, I don't want to die. So I try to challenge myself. I went to a Thai restaurant a couple of days ago, okay? I'm in this Thai restaurant. It's a Thai restaurant I've been into many times. I love Thai food. Didn't recognize one of the appetizers. It was a new appetizer on there. I'll have that. It was a gamble. It was a risk. Was I going to like it, okay? So I spent four, four something on this new appetizer off the menu to find out if I liked it. I was challenging myself to just grow. My family know this all the time. We're going to a restaurant and we're trying something different. Or, you know, when we were in Japan last year, mm-hmm. um, I had to go somewhere from our hotel and it was literally at the end of the, of the long street. Mm-hmm. But what we did to get to it was we actually went across, down one of the back streets and then across and then down. And we zigzagged all the way down. We found two other restaurants and a bar on the way down to where we wanted to go, Mm. okay? Took us about four hours to get there, but we learned areas that we, and the following day we went back and we went to one of those restaurants. Mm. And so we challenged ourselves. By the way, the appetizer I had at that Thai restaurant was god awful, (laughs) but I know it. I now know what it is. I now know what's in there. I now know I don't like it. So I educated myself. Mm. I grew Mm. from that experience. Yeah, wow. So fear is driving you forward. Fear is a great thing. Wow. You know, I race motorcycles as well. I get on a motorcycle, scares the shit out of me. Mm-hmm. But all my senses come alive. Yeah. And it's excitement. And there is a millimeter difference between fear 
and excitement. Mm. And it's just how you perceive them. If you, there's a, a famous thing where um, some commentator spoke to the guy in the Olympics and he said, are you scared? And he said, no, I'm excited. Mm. And uh, so it's how you actually relate to it. But I, I use fear to drive me. And if I'm getting lazy, and if I think, well, okay, I'm in my, I'm in my rut, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm in my flow. God, everything's going well for me. I'm being booked for speeches. I'm being flown around. Well, ah, I'm good. Challenge yourself to do something out of the normal because you don't want to be in the same place this time next month. And it can be as ridiculous as walking a different way to work, mm -hmm. okay? Reading a book on a subject you have no idea of. Mm -hmm. Speaking to someone you never thought you would have ever spoken to. Listening to a podcast. I have, um, I have the iTunes radio on, mm -hmm. and every now and then I'll click on World Radio just to be hearing a, a, a pop group from Korea or some country music from Poland. Mm -hmm. You know, just listen to this and you're like, what the hell's that? K-pop, have you listened to K-pop? Yeah. It's incredible, isn't it? Yeah. It's like in sync on acid. <laughs> it's absolutely incredible. <laughs> They're brilliant, but I never would have thought I heard of K-pop, but you know, I'm glad to say that I just try different things. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so if, if fear keeps you going forward so much, you're taking advantage of it. Why is fear and embarrassment holding so many people back? It's not. Mm. No, 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 it's not. No. It's not. It's the, um, it's the viewers the yeah. whole people that. It's visibility. Okay. Fear is not fear in itself anymore. Yeah. And I can, I can give you this one in a story. Please. And it's not a pretty story. It's a horrible one. I'm walking through a shopping mall in Glendale, mm -hmm. you know, close to us here. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's me and my wife. And in front of us, there's these couple of guys. And in front of them is, to date, one of the largest women I've ever seen in my life. Mm -hmm. You know, big woman, mm -hmm. okay? And what really kind of fascinated and got me kind of staring at this woman was not because of her immense size, mm -hmm. was the fact that this woman had her arms out like this mm -hmm. with carrier bags on each arm. And she'd done her shopping and was you know, going to her car or the bus or however she was getting home holding these bags out. Her upper body strength was incredible mm -hmm. by holding these bags. As I'm gawking at her and just kind of in awe about how she's holding these bags out, um, she tripped mm -hmm. and she went down. Mm -hmm. Now, because she was like that, she had no way of bracing herself. She actually hit herself in the mall, on the concrete floor, on her face. Mm -hmm. Now. I, I tried to grab her as fast as I could see her going down. There was no way you were stopping this woman going down. Luckily, the two gentlemen in front of me were also gentlemen, and they rushed in to grab her as well. Mm. So we got to her as fast as we could, but she was down already. Mm. Bags went everywhere. It was a mammoth slap. Everyone turned around. We quickly tried corralling all the bags in and everything like this. She was dazed. I didn't want to move her mm. to see if anything. And she started to like come to and she rocked back and the, um, the mall guards came over there and I, there was a medic rushed over quickly that had been close by. So she had everyone that she needed to and we'd got all of her bags and brought all of her bags close to her and stuff like that. And she started coming around and she's looking like this and she's looking around. And I said to her, I said, you know, is, it, is there something you've lost? If you, if, if, thinking that she's lost a handbag or a purse or something like that, or a member of the family she's trying to look for. And she just turned around and she said, no, no, no. She said, I just wanted to make sure no one was videoing it. Oh. The girl, without a doubt, the following day was bruised and beaten. Mm -hmm. Okay, I, I hope she hadn't hurt herself. She could have cracked her jaw. She could have, she could have hurt herself badly. Mm -hmm. All she cared about was not the physical pain, mm -hmm. but the pain of someone video and potentially laughing at her. Mm -hmm. Okay, you see, people aren't scared of failing now. They're scared of people actually videoing it and it becoming a laughing stock. There was a, a saying that actually uh, I heard from Elon Musk said that they will laugh at you before they applaud. Mm. And people now are not scared of failure because failure, quite simply, is an education on what not to do. I fail, I fail often, and I fail up on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. Because until I fail, I don't know how to go further. Yeah. You know, I don't know how to push that boundary. Mm -hmm. Well, that didn't work. But if I avoid that and do this, hey, I'm now 10 steps forward. Right. If I didn't get the answer I needed, what went wrong about that? Ah, I asked the wrong question. I asked it in the wrong format. All right, next time I won't do that. Mm -hmm. You can only progress 
by failing and scraping your knee. Mm -hmm. But so many people now are worried about people laughing at them. Mm. And the people that tell you that you can't do that and you shouldn't do it mm. are terrified you will and prove them wrong. Mm. <sighs> wow. Steve, you, you have a quote that I wanted to ask you about. You said, uh, I think it's from your book, you said, opportunity comes when you're in the right place to accept it. What's that mean to you? Um, I love being the dumbest person in a room. Um, if you think you're, you're, just, you're the smartest person in your group, find a new group, because uh, mm -hmm. you've got no room for growth. Mm -hmm. So you've always got to be willing to uh, listen to everyone and dismiss anyone that, that need to be. Mm -hmm. But you've got to be open. You've got to be listening to other people. And some of the greatest knowledge and education and tweaks that I've had for my, my business, my growth, my consulting, my speaking, has come from people that are nowhere near the industry. Mm -hmm. But they've had such a, a third eye view mm -hmm. of what I'm involved in, that they've been able to step in and go, well, why are you doing that? Mm -hmm. I would have thought you would have done that. And they get to see a better view of it. I'm trying to think who it was. That, I think it was um, Joe Polish said that, um, you can't see the picture when you're in the frame. Mm. And I thought that's a great perspective to put it. So I listen to absolutely everyone. The valet boy, you've got an opinion on my business? I want to hear it. Yeah. You know, because you're an idiot the second you think you know all of the tricks. And the second you think you got it sussed, is a millimeter or a second away before it gets screwed up. Wow. And, and someone like the valet guy might have a, a really close up view that could be missed when you're at 30,000 feet too. Absolutely, yeah. so listen to absolutely everyone. Yeah. It doesn't hurt, it doesn't cost, mm -hmm. but it will cost a fortune if you ignore it. Yeah, Steve, listening is, is a theme that we come, keep coming back to, and you have a, a story about a guy who you listened to, he, he called you and he said he wanted tickets to the Playboy Mansion, yeah. and you were listening close and you could tell in his voice that, that wasn't the truth. So we had, um, we had this guy it was funny because I actually got written up in uh, one of America's biggest uh, um, gay magazines about this article. <laughs> it was kind of funny because my, my kids think I'm pretty much a Neanderthal. Um, so one of the girls was in my office and she'd got this phone call from this guy and mm -hmm. she put it through to me and she said, I want you to kind of like get on this call because something's not right. Mm -hmm. She said, she, she, I've got a feeling about it. And I went, all right. So I picked up the phone. This guy's on the phone, he's like, yeah, hey, you know, I need two tickets to the Playboy Mansion. Mm -hmm. All right, okay, and he was quite, not stroppy, but you know, I was trying to gauge where this was going. All right, fine, let me get a pad and pen and you know, let me start taking some details down. So, you know, what's your name? You know, where are you coming from? I'm coming in from New York. Oh, great, okay, and is this particular Midsummer Night Stream party that you want to go to? Yeah, it is, and you want two tickets. Has, has she gone over the pricing with you? Yeah, she has, and I'm like, okay. I didn't have a pad, I didn't have a pen. Mm -hmm. So I said to the guy, I said, well, hang, hang on a minute, let me just get another, let me get another pen. I, uh, hang on, let me, I got you on my headset. Uh, so how did you, uh, did you to come over to California much? Making out that I'm trying to find a pen. Mm -hmm. He's like, oh, yeah, 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 I do. Oh, do you go to LA or do you, uh, no, I usually go north. What's up north? Oh, it's the wine country. Do you know I haven't been up there? I said, it's kind of wrong, but you know, I've never been up there. So why is it so beautiful? Oh, it's that, and bang, voice changed. Mm. He's now talking about something he's into. Mm -hmm. I'm like, yeah, you know, I've always been a whiskey guy. What's, what's the fascination with wine? Mm. He said, oh, it's this and the grape, it's from the soil, it's that. Now there's passion. I went, oh, hang on a minute, I found a pen. So just quickly, what was your, how did you spell your name again? And okay, two tickets to the Playboys. Yeah, it was, <laughs> bang. Mood swing was the, right mm -hmm. down to it. I said, okay, look, I'm just gonna fill in this paperwork while I'm talking to you. Can you educate me a little bit more? Tell me about wine. Mm. He's like, oh, it's beautiful. And I said, you get over often? He's like, yeah, I try to do this and I get there and then we go here and mm. then we go there. So the we was coming in. Yeah. Okay. All right, okay. And so, 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 so you get up to the, so whereabouts in Napa do you go and where don't you go? Where do I need to avoid? Mm. And he's like, oh, you need to go here. You need to go there. It's brilliant. Okay, great. And I said, I said, and that's, that's the two of you that always go up there. I said, oh, yeah, you know, me and my partner, we, we love getting up there. Mm. So the partner term came mm -hmm. in. So, okay, lock and load. And so he's going, I said, okay. And so 
I, I've got everything done. I said, I've got all my paperwork. So I'm sorry that we digressed so much. He's like, mm -hmm. oh, okay. And you could feel the anticlimax that he was getting off of talking about what he really liked. Yeah. So I said, so, okay, so I need to grab your credit card, two tickets to the Playboy Mansion. Uh, have you got your hotel or do we need to sort that? No, I'm going to need a hotel there as well. This is a guy going to the Playboy Mansion mm -hmm. and he's deflated and having the conversation. <laughs> So, and I won't use his name. And uh, I said, uh, all right, I said, I'm going to go out on a limb here and you're free to hang up on this conversation anytime you like. I said, but uh, here's how I'm seeing it. You want two tickets to the Playboy Mansion. Yeah, yeah. But you don't care about the Playboy Mansion. You have no interest in the Playboy Mansion at all. Well, yeah, I, I want to go to that. I haven't been and I want to go. I said, I'm going to go out on a limb here. You're gay, aren't you? Mm. Quiet. I'm just waiting for the click. He says, yeah, why does that matter? I said, to me it doesn't, but to you it should. I said, because there's no way in the world a couple of gay guys should be going to the Playboy Mansion. So what's the story? I talked to you about wine. You're all over it. Hell, I could send you up to Napa, get you in a sub in the best vineyards, and I reckon we could have a conversation for an hour why it's the best thing in the world to do. I said, but the Playboy Mansion? That's not doing it for you. So what's the driving force behind you needing this? And he says, well, I'm a broker. I'm a stockbroker. And he said, and I need to be able to throw the guys off, off scent. Hmm. He said, so my idea is I come back with a bunch of photographs and uh, everything's cool. Hmm. And, uh, you know, tell the boys I was at the mansion at, at the weekend. We're all good. He said, you know, the environment here is not one that's good for me. So I'm like, all right, okay. So this is how we're going to do it. I'm going to sell you two tickets to the Playboy Mansion. He was like, yeah, okay, great. I said, but you ain't going. <laughs> I said, what we're going to do is we're going to use that money and we're going to send you up to the wine country. I said, you're going to have a great time. On the way back through LA, I'll get you a couple of stubs from another couple of clients that are going to the mansion. You can take those back to the, to the floor, drop them on your desk and refuse to make any conversation about it. And that was it. That's what actually happened to him. So he actually came back through LA, he paid, and then he took home the stubs. I said, tell people they don't allow photographs in, in there, which at the time they weren't. Mm. And he was like, great. I said, just leave them on your desk. And if anyone says, what were you up to? I was in LA at the weekend, had a good time. Hey, what happens? Stays there. Mm. I said, shut your mouth. I said, the least you say, the more they'll be interested. And that was it. Sure. So they actually went up to Napa. They had a great time. Um, and they were still my clients until a while ago when Sadly, there was an accident and one of them died. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, that was, uh, that was my story. But they actually, uh, and it was kind of cool, they reached out to, to one of the biggest gay magazines mm -hmm. and told them, and uh, so that their names again, to protect his job, <laughs> they used fake names, but they actually interviewed me for an article in that magazine. Wow. So it was real cool. I really enjoyed doing it. Yeah. So, and all that, a better experience for them because... You listened. So well, far. again, I said to you right at the beginning of the conversation, I've never given anyone what they asked for. I gave them what they needed and, and desired. Yeah. So these guys, they had a goal that sadly they were being forced to, which was to throw someone off a scent, mm -hmm. which is just bullshit in today's world. Mm -hmm. But that's what was necessary. Mm -hmm. But what we did was we did it by giving them something that they desired. Yeah. And we gave them a weekend. They didn't lie. They, mm -hmm. they went over to the West Coast for the weekend. Mm -hmm. You know, they didn't lie. Mm -hmm. They just throw the stubs there. Yeah. They're just helping me out with my trash can. <laughs> Perfect. Steve, before I ask my last question, where can people look for you online? Well, anyone in the US, if they've got a cell phone, they can text the word ugly works. It's one word, ugly works, W O R K S to 345 345. Or they can go to stevedsims.com, subscribe for the newsletter. If they actually do either one of those, they'll get a video of my chug test and they'll also get a PDF of the Blue Fishing Playbook that's featured in this book. Wow, awesome. So Steve, my final question is, if you're talking to someone who's a leader of their own group and they wanna create a culture where people are like you, they're taking action, they're making big things happen, what would you suggest to that person? First of all, audit who's in your group, mm -hmm. okay? Because there's going to be people in the group that should not be in the group. Mm -hmm. And they're the cancer cells that you've got to get rid of. Mm -hmm. So first of all, you've got to have a group in your community that you can communicate with. And then look at them and find out what makes them tick. You may get people in there that are just doing it for a job, 
because they're trying to make money to make ends meet for X. Find out what that X is and incentivize that X to become just a Y, okay? And then look at the people in there that want excitement. I'm a great believer in bonuses, but I hate giving cash. Uh, the reason is, I give you 500 bucks now, you're going to go, oh, thank you very much. You're going to pay your phone bill, you're going to pay your, your flight home, you're going to pay gas in your tank. It's going to go on bills. And if I ask you in six months' time, what did you do with that 500 bucks? You'll go, oh, I don't really know, but thank you very much. But instead of that 500 bucks, if I say to you, hey, I believe you like Thai food. Just found out there's a new restaurant in your area. I've already paid the bill. Schedule it. I've covered you. You're going to have an experience. And again, that experience is going to be one that in a year's time, you're going to be turning around going, I never got the chance to tell you. I went to that Thai food mm -hmm. restaurant. And you can even phone them up in advance and say, make sure you give them that appetizer. You know, that weird working one that you know, <laughs> tastes like crap. So you can share the same experience I did. But uh, you know, do that kind of thing and they'll remember it because you remember experiences far more than you do price tags. Mm. Awesome. Steve, thank you so much. All the best, pal. This is great.